morning, everyone. Welcome to live Facebook Coffee Talk. I'm Michelle Kui. I'm a, a confidence coach who works with negative self-talkers. So today I have a guest that you are going to love. Kathy Sikorsky Esquire is a pra practicing and consulting elderly law elder law attorney for over 30 years. She speaks to promote finance and legal preparation in the aging crisis. The author of two books, Showering with Nana, Confession of Serial Killer Caregiver, and Who Moved My Teeth? Preparing for Self, Loved Ones, and Caregiving. Kathy's second book premiered as number one on Amazon. With many televisions, radio, and podcast appearance, she has also been featured on the Huffington Post, AARP, and is she source expert from, for the Women, Women's Media Center in Washington, D.C. Kathy serves on the board of director of Nancy's House, a nonprofit dedicated to the speak for caregivers. She can also be seen on the Westchester Story Slam YouTube channel. Her website is www.kathysikorsky.com slash speaker. And Kathy has a blog. You just have to laugh where caregiver is comedy at kathysikorsky.com. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me and give a warm welcome to Kathy. Kathy, so much. Thank you for coming, coming to the show. Thank you, Michelle. That was a very nice, warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And I think um, I'm having you here because this is a very time, timely, sensitive topic that I think everyone, including men, women, every generation should hear about. And, you know, I, before we go in, because one of the things that I picked out from you was the, the caregiver piece. I was wondering, can you give us a little bit um, background in terms of how did you get into um, being an attorney and, and being an advocate for the women and caregivers? So I, I'm a small town practice attorney in southeastern Pennsylvania, and that was really where I was practicing general practice law. And when my grandmother was 92 and I had a two-year-old toddler, my grandmother came to live with me for a six-month period. And I instantaneously became a caregiver. And at that point in time, I had decided to be a stay-at-home mom for a while. That, uh, well, that actually became my first book, which you talked about, Confessions of a Serial Caregiver. And that turned into what I didn't expect was I became a caregiver for eight different family members and friends in the past 30 years. Not as my job, but what might happened with my job is I realized that elder law, which really deals with these issues, which deals with aging and caregiving and Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, all of those things, you know, that we talk about uh, in the caregiving sphere, that became what I needed to know practically because I was a caregiver for my, uh, my mother-in-law, my mom, my two great aunts, my brother-in-law who had multiple sclerosis, a friend of mine who had a severe brain injury. Um, all of these people uh, needed my help and I was fortunate enough to be able to give it to them, not just as an elder lawyer, but as a caregiver. And so really, truly, Michelle, mm -hmm. my caregiving experience is what informed and created my legal experience. That's exactly how it happened. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think is the biggest problem when it comes to elder, elder care? Because we all age. Such a great question. Such a great question. And of course, it's informed by my perspective, right? <laughs> so I'm going to say that it's lack of preparation. We're not prepared, you know? We don't think about it until we're in a crisis. That's really usually how it happens. And part of you is thinking, well, why would I? You know, I'm a 30-year-old. And, and exactly, that's what I was when my grandmother came to live with me. I think I was 32, 34. Um, I was in my 30s. Aging and caregiving and, and that whole concept was foreign to me. And I was taking care of a toddler. Why would I want to think about that? But the issue is twofold. Number one, hopefully we're all going to get old. And number two, you're going to have people in your sphere, your mom, your aunt, your uncle, who are aging people. And so they're going to need help and they're going to need probably your help. And so all of us 
could get prepared for that by doing the legal and financial work we need to not feel so overwhelmed when a crisis happens. Hmm. What, what, what do you think is the biggest challenge when it comes to caregivers? I mean, you know, there's, there's um, support, like where, where are they going to li- live, right? right? How, what are they going to eat? And right. I think what's even more um, burning is the finance issue. And I think right. money gets in our way. And this is what I see in the coaching as well. Money gets in our way. The first thing that comes to our mind is how much is it going to cost me? Right. First thing, time and money. Two things that, that, that really we focus on all our lives, right? Time Mm -hmm. and money, time and money. Um, And in in the elder sphere, then it's money because it's money. It costs money to take care of someone in in a nursing home or get help in your house or, you know, how much is this going to cost to even get long-term care insurance or, right? Those kinds of things. They're all money questions. But Mm -hmm. time is, oh my gosh, do I now have to take off work to take care of my mom? Um, I don't have time for that. How much is it going to cost for me to get somebody in my house and then me be able to go and run all these errands for people and where do I get help who are the people who can help me you don't even you need time to research all the people in the caregiving world who you need to help you so Mm -hmm. I need money yeah old answer and fun, funny how you brought it up because now I'm thinking about my parents, right? Because my parents, I live with them. Good. And they're, in 80, <laughs> they're in their 80s. You know, my mom is in her 70s. And now that you're bringing this up, I'm thinking, oh, wait, you know, yeah, okay. So how do I, how do, I do this? How do I prepare myself for this, right? Um, yes. Hopefully, so, it's, a, it's a one-time quick thing. <laughs> We're hoping well, it's the way to go. So what, what it is now, especially if it, they're healthy and they're doing okay, is conversations. They have mm-hmm. to start with conversations. And the conversations have to wrap themselves around this. Do you have your legal documents in order? Do you have the most important, for me, the most important legal document, which is the financial power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney? And the 30-second definition of a power of attorney is it's a document that you sign over to your agent, that's the person you're going to put in charge, to act as if they are you in any capacity and every capacity. So it's a very powerful tool, right? Very powerful. So you have to choose wisely. You choose this person who's going to be in charge of all your stuff, your money, whatever. And then a healthcare power attorney, all your healthcare decisions. But it's an important, important, and today, boy, do we know this more than ever. Today, if somebody becomes incapacitated quickly, and even temporarily, who's going to handle your affairs? Because you're not a dead person. That's what a will is for. See, this is what I always tell people. The difference between a power of attorney and a will is live people and dead people. That's what it is. Powers of attorney are for live people who are sick and incapacitated. Wills are for dead people. What happens mm-hmm. when I'm dead, right? Mm-hmm. And so for your parents, perfect example. Do you have those powers of attorney? Is there somebody in charge in case something happens? Mm-hmm. And then do you have a will in case that happens? And do you have, I don't know why, I'm trying to, I, can, I guess now in today's world with what's going on with the virus, the next thing is the living will. And, and this is an often misunderstood document. It is not a general durable power of attorney. It doesn't generally give people authority to take care of your affairs. A living will is usually a very, very specific document that says, what happens if I'm in a permanent vegetative state? What happens? What do I want done? It kind of would be good to have that right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's tricky because... They it usually asks questions. People get them off the internet. They check boxes, and it says, "I do or I don't want to be on a ventilator." But we're in a different world now, so these documents are tricky, but they're important. And if you're 18 years of old or older, you should have them. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between the living well and the well? Because you you said well is for the dead people, right? So what's right. the difference between a living well and a well? So another name for a living will is an advanced directive. If you hear the words advanced directive and living will, they usually mean the same thing. I, I tell people it's like, it's like Sean Combs, P. Diddy, Sean Combs, two different names, same guy, right? So advanced directive, living will, same thing. Usually what it is, is a document that says, if I am in a permanent vegetative state, I'm not coming out. Everybody agrees 
the party is over. What do I want? Do I want to be kept comfortable? Do I want to be on a ventilator? Do I want antibiotics? Do I, what do I want? And you fill out this form and you tell somebody what you want. And then you put someone in charge of that. It's either called your surrogate or your agent. It's different in every state. There's also what they call do not resuscitate orders. I'm sure you've mm -hmm. heard of those, yeah. DNR. Yeah. And that usually means, that's usually, yeah, that's yeah. usually only used in cases where someone has been sick for a very long time or they are very elderly and they, and they have said, I'm done. Don't try to resuscitate me. No. That is not uh, something that usually a young or healthy person would ever want to have right? No, that yeah. would be kind of rare. And sometimes that's called an advanced directive or is part of a living will. Mm -hmm. so a will. Of... Sorry to interrupt. That's but okay. a will Go is ahead. an actual, when I'm dead, what happens to my stuff? Period. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there's complicated uh, different documents that people have to fill. Like, how do I know? Where do I go to even get started? <laughs> okay. Well, of course, you know, I'm always going to say go to a lawyer. And, and I know that that sometimes, sometimes cost prohibitive. I know people feel that way, but I think you need to make sure that that's really true. Don't talk yourself out of it because you just don't want to spend the money on something that's going to be good for five or 10 or 15 years, depending on what your situation is, because you want it done right, especially if you have assets, if you have a house, if you have, you know, money in the bank, if you have 401ks and IRAs and say, if you have assets, you should have a lawyer do this and do it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, when my kids were 18 and went to college, I made them sign a power of attorney because I didn't want a college or, or a hospital in a city three, four, five hours away to say to me, oh, no, 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 they're adults. They're 18. They're adults. You, we can't, it's HIPAA. We can't talk to you, right? We're not telling you anything unless you have a paper that says we can. My 18 year old kid didn't have to go to a lawyer. Fortunately, they had a mother for a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but I will be brutally honest with you. I probably would have just downloaded one from the internet for them, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends where you are in your life. I am always going to tell you to go to an attorney. However, I realize that Desperate times call for desperate measures. And I would beg you to at least do your homework and recognize that these documents are important and you should at the very least do some research and homework into getting them and then decide financially what you can afford to do. Mm. Because you can't afford not to have them. Mm -hmm. You can't. This is what happens, Michelle. You go into the hospital. You are very sick. Your parents... Your parents or a family member would be wanting to take care of you, right? Mm -hmm. They have no authority. And so if you are single and you go into the hospital and, and, and you can't make decisions, you're incapacitated, technically you have to go to court and get a guardianship. You have to get a judge and a doctor to say, she's not able to make decisions for herself we're going to make you legal guardians of that sick person. And then you have to report to the court everything you do, every decision that you make. It is complex, expensive, and quite frankly, a pain in the neck, mm -hmm. especially for someone who loves you and is already going to be doing it anyway. Yeah. And I heard it takes a long time. So if people who don't have the power of attorney, it takes a long time to access the bank. If you know they need to take to go out through the, the money. court situation, exactly. Right. And it's exp and it's more expensive. It's right. always going to cost more money than mm -hmm. just getting documents filled out. Always. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. You know what what is the benefit of having to do all this? Like what like emotionally. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, well, I'm so young. My parents are still pretty healthy. Is there a need for me to do this? And because it seems like it's a lot of work. So what, what can they so do? So here's the benefit. There's two, two sides. Number one, you walk out the door, you get hit by a truck, you can't do anything. Who's going to take care of your issues, right? Who's going to take care? And you're not dead, by the way. You're alive, but you're sick and you can't do anything. This is what happened to my girlfriend with a brain injury, right? She was for a time incapacitated and incapable of taking care of her affairs. Um, 
So, so that's, everybody thinks they're fine and they're Teflon and nothing bad is gonna happen to them. That's the advantage. Your parents who are, you know, closer to my generation, come on people, you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, you should have this stuff. It's more likely than not that you're gonna need some help, right? <laughs> just so, be real, right? <laughs> don't even ask me that question, right? Just be real. Just be real. Why do you think people are afraid to talk about this? And, and Well, there was this old thing, I don't want a will because then I'm gonna die. If I make out a will, then I'm probably gonna die. I mean, it's a superstition, right? Uh, yeah. But it's no different than being financially prepared. Well, I don't want to save any money because then what? I won't have any fun spending money. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's silly. It's silly. Yeah. Just do it. Just, and then when it's done, it's done. Sit in your nice little fireproof box and you're done. You should. I will tell you that 90% of the time I have a client who gets these things done, they're so happy. It's a sense of relief. Okay. Yay. I did it. I'm finished. And is it a lifetime thing or do you have to like keep going back and update and? Of course you do because life changes, you know, mm -hmm. people get married, people get divorced, people die. If you've put people in charge of stuff who you don't want in charge of stuff or they move to, you know, France and it's impossible for them to help you anymore, you have to be on the lookout for that. So I say to people, look at them every three years and every five years, you probably might need to make a change. Just be aware of that right? Most people stick it in their underwear drawer. I say, pull it out, throw the nice underwear aside, pull it out, look at it, stick it back in if you want to. But the point is you have to check. You have to check. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we changed the way we save money. And I know this seems weird. What does this have to do with wills and powers of attorney and whatever? But this is the deal. Most people have 401ks, mm -hmm. IRAs, or three Bs, right? That's how we save money now. We don't have big savings accounts or big CDs or thing, big stock accounts unless they're in that 401k place. Those things have beneficiary designations. So first of all, check your beneficiary designation and check it every three to five years because people, things change. People die. People get divorced. People don't like people anymore that they liked when they made them the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and this is tricky because Pennsylvania, where I live, is different. Every state is different. But in Pennsylvania, if I don't have that power of attorney, circle mm -hmm. back to that, and, and I get very, very sick, my husband has no access to my 401k or IRA to use that money to help him in any kind of a capacity because I didn't say he could have it. And so the only thing that money can be used for is my healthcare needs. So if we're using that money to pay our mortgage, he's done. Unless he has a power of attorney that says he's allowed to use that money. Mm -hmm. It's not inherent in the money that we're saving. If we had had a joint bank account and it was all there, he could have taken it and done whatever he wanted, go to Tahiti, you know? Mm -hmm. But you can't get into my 401k because you know what? That's only owned by one person, me. So you need a legal right to get in there. Mm -hmm. So here we are again, complicated, complex financial issues attached to legal issues. And I like that you and I are both always trying to encourage people to look at their finances. Yeah. Look at how you're saving money. Look at how you have access to your money look at how, who's going to get your money. Um, and it's like you said, when we were just chit chatting before this, we have heard for probably 50 years, save three months of money, right? <laughs> three to six months of money. People still aren't doing that, are they? Mm -mm. Not what, seeing what, do that. Think, what do you think would change after the pandemic? It's so funny. Cause I had this conversation with my, I think it was my daughter. My kids are grown. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I am super hopeful that people are going to realize, now it was my husband too, that all that little stuff that we thought we needed and wanted and had to have and was really sucking our savings dry, but we didn't notice it, all of a sudden we're noticing that we're not spending money, right? People, people who are fortunate enough to not 
be in a crisis now because they're not working. There's a lot, there's a lot of people who are doing okay. They're even getting a, a unemployment that's more than they expected and it's helping them and it's helping them. But what they're also doing is not spending money. They're not going to Starbucks. They're not going to the movies. They're not going out for dinner. They're not even getting a pizza on Friday night, you know, like they used to. And all of a sudden they're saving money in spite of themselves, mm -hmm. right? And I'm really hopeful that the pandemic shows them that it's possible and important. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I, I think it changes a lot yeah. of different perspectives, right? Um, it changes the perspective of how we see money, our relationship to money. Money is becoming more of a, I need to have it in order to protect myself so that I don't put my my myself into that position where I'm going to be like in this crisis mode, like mm -hmm. I am experiencing now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to think of a way to either save up or kind of plan ahead just in case something like this happen again, which mm -hmm. might happen again. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, in, in the clients that you've been working with, um, what gender are they? Is there more, more men, more women? Like what's the, who's more conscious about, about women, planning? women, bring their men to me. Men don't come to me willingly or initially, almost ever. It's almost always their wives, their daughters, you know, it's very rare to have a man contact me on his own to say, oh, I read your book. I heard you speak. You know, I, I, I unless, unless the only exception to that rule that I've seen in a long time is if they're a caregiver or they've had a caregiving experience. Mm -hmm. then they know from the work of caregiving that they should also be ready for this. Yeah. That's very interesting. And I think we talked about this earlier too. Women are tend to be more conscious about planning and we're like about this is going out. We got to save it. We got to plan it ahead. So go ahead. And women are the ones who suffer the most financially in my world. Mm. Most of their, in my generation, Gen X, Gen X, baby boomers, whatever, there's still that very much a traditional marriage type situation where often the woman has stayed home to take care of children, has stepped out of her career and stepped back in many times, out and in, out and in. But what's that, what that has done is kind of um, not completely erase, but certainly lighten her, her retirement funds, right? Mm -hmm. Dramatically. And her husband has a big chunk of that retirement, which is great because most of these people are in great marriages. It's considered family money, family money, right? That's fantastic. The problem is family money in one person's name. Remember, go back to that 401k, IRA thing, family money in one person's name, if it's your husband and 90% of the time your husband is the one who gets sick first, would have to be used for his care unless you have a plan to make sure you don't become destitute as the wife of someone who has a bunch of money and you don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the world doesn't see that as family money. They see that as his money. Wow. Yeah. And that's, I, I think that's really shocking. It blows a lot of people's mind. Like, oh, wait, why don't I can't use that money? What do you mean? <laughs> right? Yes. And it's not completely, completely true across the board. It's severely true where I live. But what it should help you do or decide is that nonetheless, I should get prepared and make sure that I have all the documents in place that if I need to, my husband and I, my partner and I, whoever that may be, can make sure that our financial picture is how we want it to be, even in our old age. Yeah. For someone who's looking into um, a new job or transitioning to a new job, what are some of the things that they should be looking out for in addition to having the legal document and looking their benefit? Like just from your Put money in your 401k. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm so old that I, there was no 401ks when I got out of law school and started to work. There was no thing it didn't exist we had a savings account <laughs> that's it and not only put the money in there but also uh, maximize the match. yes match it <laughs> get the match get the highest match you can afford right and if there's a the point in your life where you can't afford the match for a while you can't put it in you know dial it back but then dial it up again because things come and go right you get a raise whatever that kind of a thing like that's the first thing truthfully i would say um the yeah. second thing is 
you have beneficiary designations at work usually. You know, sometimes you'll have a life insurance policy. Make sure you do that correctly. You have a beneficiary designation that goes along with your 401k, your IRA, if you have your own IRA. Make sure you've done that and, and build it out because if you haven't, you've got a tax implication that you don't want to deal with, right? You want the money to go where you want it to go. Um, and ask your parents to check theirs too. If your parents are in their 40s and 50s and 60s, ask them to check these documents, their, their, their beneficiary designations, and ask them, do you have your stuff in order? Because I'm the one who's going to have to deal with it. And where do you keep your stuff? I, I, where I have to ask. Where do you keep it? Where yeah, I have to it? ask my dad, where do you keep your stuff? <laughs> where do you keep your stuff? My husband made a special folder. He told both of our daughters, this is where it is. This is what it says on it. And inside, you'll find everything you need to know and who to contact, who all our people are, you know, in case anything happens. That's really good advice. So, yeah. So if you're lucky enough to be starting a new job at some point in time, um, you know, check out your benefits. The other thing is, is a lot of people don't know that there's often benefits at work if you're a caregiver. If you are, in fact, helping someone as a caregiver, they often have caregiving benefits. Everyone kind of has a, a lead on the FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, where you know you can take off if you have someone you're caring for. Um, and you should definitely check that out and use it if you need to. But there's also... So yeah, it's, they have to give you 12 weeks. It's still unpaid as far as I know um, of leave. And it was recently amended to include, I know it's your spouse and your children are automatic. And I think it was amended to include your parents too. Um, and, and sometimes you can, some companies are more generous, right? So if you take care of a brother, let's say, uh, like I took care of my brother-in-law. Um, sometimes they will allow that as well. Um, so there's benefits. My only point is this. There's a lot of young people who are caregivers. They think 25% of the caregiving population of 66 million people is actually millennials. That's a lot of people who are young, who are caregiving. And you would be shocked at the benefits that go unused. So if that's something you need to know about, call, talk to your HR people. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know about the king care until recently that, you know, one of my, one of my colleagues actually took king care and I was like, oh, what is that? What's king care? And then I start looking into, I didn't know that you can take time off as a caregiver for, for your elderly, for yep. your people in your house. Yep. About that. Yes, 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 yes. And sometimes you can get paid. There's, there's payment plans through the government and sometimes your work will have information about that. Um, often they're called EAPs, Employee Assistance Programs, um, that have more, just there's more stuff there than you know. There's sometimes, there's sometimes legal documents that you can get, they're attached to a legal service. Sometimes there's financial advice, right, that you can get. I mean, there's probably so much more freebies out there, especially if you're working for a large corporation than you've ever taken advantage of. And if you're getting a new job and you're going into a nice big corporation, check it out. Maybe they have these great things for you. Yeah. So we have a couple of minutes left. Before we go, what would be one takeaway that you wanted to give to the, to the listener today? Please, please get prepared. Get your, get your financial power of attorney, your healthcare power of attorney, your will, your living will get those documents however you need to because those are the four things that are the foundation of what you need to have in case something happens to you and if you have parents tell them to do the same thing that's my takeaway beautiful and and i know you have two books are, are these i uh, do are these I cool tips in the book no, tell, her. tell us about that book this book will give you lots of what we talked about today. The first half is wonderful, good legal information, questions to ask if you go to talk to a lawyer, how do I deal with it? Second half is if you're a caregiver, lots and lots of tips and tools, practical tools for caregiving. So great. I love my, I love my book. My first and, book is a memoir. I heard, I heard you're working on the third one. <laughs> I am, I am, I am. This is my first one, which was a memoir about taking care. This is me in a cartoon. They made me a cartoon. I was so excited. I love it. You have the shower cap too. <laughs> my two-year-old. That's why it's called Showering with Nana. And it's a delightful, hilarious romp, very touching, 
about going through caregiving with a 92 year old and a two year old. Oh, yeah. so beautiful. And my third book, hopefully out next year, is tentatively about conversations we need to be having mm. with our spouses, our friends, our parents, and how we can lead that into being prepared. Yeah, it's so important. Where, where can people find you if they wanted to get some legal advice or? Kathy Sikorsky, which it's behind Michelle's heads, is Kathy with a C. There you go. <laughs> Let me Kathy just Sikorsky. get out of the way. <laughs> just go on, on Google and type in Kathy Sikorsky. I'll come up all over the place. But my website is kathysikorsky.com. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I and my and books I are on Amazon. I will link all of these information in the episode notes so that you can check out Kathy's website and also her books on Amazon. It's an amazing book. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you so Michelle. much for coming, Kathy. Thank you. What a great day. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And thank you everyone for watching the live coffee talk show. I will be back on Wednesday at eight o'clock in the morning. Make sure you stay tuned. Bye. Bye everyone.